Good morning and welcome to Story Hill Church Online. If you don't know me, my name is Evan Kaler. I'm one of the worship leaders here, and we are just so, so grateful that you guys decided to join us this morning and spend your time in worship of God. And so wherever you are, uh, we just ask that you make a joyful noise with all your heart uh, as we worship our God. Stand before your maker, full of wonder, full of fear. Come behold his power and glory, yet with confidence drawn near. For the one who holds the heavens and commands the stars above is the God who bends to bless us with an unrelenting love. together just so glad in our hearts that we serve a good God and we worship a good God. Um, but he is good to us because he has died for us and he sent his son for us. But we don't always acknowledge that. We often fall astray and we often turn our eyes away from God and what he has done for, with, for us. And so as we continue our worship service, would you join us in this prayer of confession, just confessing our need for God, confessing our need for a Savior? Merciful God, you made us in your image with a mind to know you, a heart to love you, and a will to serve you. But our knowledge is imperfect. Our love is inconsistent. Our obedience incomplete. Day by day, we fail to grow into your likeness. We acknowledge our failure to glorify you the way you designed us to. In your tender love, forgive us through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I was an orphan 
lost at the fall Running away when I'd hear your call But Father, you worked your will I had no righteousness on my own I had a right to draw near your throne But Father, you loved me still And your love before you laid the world's foundation destined to adopt me as your own. You have raised me up so high above my station. I'm a child of God by grace and grace alone. and it's good to be with you this morning. We're picking back up in 2 Peter chapter 2, so we're actually in verses 10 through 16 this morning. Uh, this morning we're going to read about Peter's address to false teachers again. So uh, last week Aaron talked the first part of Peter's address in chapter 2 to false teachers, or picking up where he left, left off, and it's pretty obvious that we need to watch out for false teachers. But I think there's actually two ways we need to have responses and are being on guard against them. And, and the first one is really probably the one that comes to mind, most often, it's that we need to flee from them, right? Like, not to listen, but to run from their teaching. Like, we recognize them, we see them, we point them out, and then we run from them. But this morning, then, we're actually going to have a talk about our equal need, and it's to actually watch out for their sin. So it's not just watch out for what they say, but also watch out for what they do. And this points us to our second response. We need to learn from their teaching. Because not only can their teaching lead you astray, but the same sin that holds them can also bind you. So as we read and see their conduct, we have, to, we have to ask ourselves, well, what do I learn from this? And while we would never take heed to a false teacher's teaching, the irony is that their sin, while it further reveals that they are indeed false teachers, it's actually instructing us on how not to live. And so we're going to see this as we unpack Second Peter today. Um, Peter's going to unpack the fullness of their sin, and in particular, three areas. He's going to talk about their pride and their lust and their greed. And so not only are we warned against those who teach the opposite of the Bible says and warned against where that path leads, but we also then must recognize, as Peter's addressing them, like you are so far down this path that it always began with one step in that direction. 
And you might have the tendency, as we read this this morning, think, well, maybe we should just move on more to something more suited to me. Um, as we read today, you're, you most likely might think, well, that's not me at all. And in some ways, it clearly won't be. Like, the reason Peter's talking about false teachers and, and being distinct in their sin, and the reason he's addressing them particularly, is, is the same reason that we're going to sense some distinction between us and them as well. And yet, these three sins that Peter's going to unpack, they, they touch essentially every human life. And we've got to remember, we need not to measure ourselves against other sinners. I mean, that's not our standard. We measure ourselves against a holy, good, perfect God. Because of this, pride and lust and greed, they, they mark their life, but they also mark ours as well. Like, we have to ask ourselves, do I struggle with this too? And the answer is, of, of course, yes. And because that's the case, um, we must remember this morning that that path of destruction is always something we take one step at a time. Steps that we too take daily in our sin. So don't miss this morning the danger in the, in the way that you might be also living your life. So again, one more time, we're just going to unpack pride, lust, and greed in Peter's charge against these false teachers. And as he unpacks, we'll see the level of their love of sin. And we need to take warnings from their lives, but also hold up his words as a mirror to see our own areas where we may be in too in danger of our own sin and being led astray. So here's what Peter says in verse 10. He says, Bold, arrogant people, they are not afraid to slander the glorious ones. However, angels who are greater in might and power do not bring a slanderous charge against them before the Lord. But these people, like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, slander what they do not understand, and in their destruction, they too will be destroyed. They'll be pay paid back with harm for the harm they have done. First things, here's what we don't know for sure from this text. Like right there in the beginning of verse 10, uh, is that we don't know who these glorious beings are. There's a few people these could be. They could be angels, whether good or bad, right? Like good angels or fallen angels and demons. They could also be a reference to church leaders, but we just don't know for sure. And so it's not super helpful to build out our applications today from even scholarly speculations. Um, but the other thing is it doesn't really matter who they are because there are some things we can know for sure um, about these false teachers and their bold, boldness and arrogance. And here's what we can know. In their boldness and arrogance, they are slandering those who are greater than them. Like, they are arrogantly reviling those who have authority over them. Like, in their sin, they walk as if someone who has complete authority with no fear of speaking or sinning against God. Like, their sin, it's compared to, we see this happening here, it's compared to the good and God-ordained role of angels who, who are um, decreed or supposed to carry out God's decrees and, and judgments. But even these good angels who are to be the messengers and the ones who bring about God's justice, this is, this is an ordained purpose, right? They're refusing to speak in authority against these sinning false teachers. So what Peter's simply trying to do then in this passage, he's trying to contrast the humility here. An angel who right now would high outrank these false teachers is bowing down in authority to or in submission to God's authority. Yet these false teachers who are nowhere near this are walking around strutting in complete arrogance. And so verse 12 says, and it continues, it says these people then, again the false teachers that are foolish in their pride, and it's so great that they are like unreasonable, irrational animals who only pursue what their instinct tells them. And in this pursuit they are caught or killed. Like Peter is saying, just as an animal mindlessly walks and meets its destruction, so too these false teachers in their pride will be paid back in judgment for all the harm they've done. Like, like as an animal in its drive and in its instinct, it walks and stops to stand right in the crosshairs of a gun. Like that's the depiction here. And I was thinking about this, and, and there's this like really fine line between hunting and just hiding in the woods while it's still dark and covering yourself in deer urine, right? I mean, like, hide-and-seek being covered in deer, like, in rut um, from t a tinks bottle and actually hunting, that's a really fine line. And the reason hunters will do that is because that's when bucks actually are going after does in the rut in November. And as I was reading this text, I couldn't help but think about deer season. And um, my dad and I, that's my, our favorite things to do is to go deer hunting. This past year, um, right at sunrise, I mean, this is early in the morning, we just walked out back to our property and the biggest buck I've ever seen on our property before came walking out. I was like, oh my gosh, this is it. I'm going to get a shot. Um, and before he could even take a shot, I mean, he, he darted into the woods, stepped in the woods like, that's it. He's gone. But the 
the best part of the story was, like, we had thought right before we got in the blind, we still had this deer and rut um, scent that the bucks are chasing does, and we had poured it all out about 10 yards from the blind. And, of course, here comes this buck, full of instinct, one thing on his mind, chasing early in the morning, stood 10 yards from our blind, shot dead. Great day for me. Like, big day for me. Like, I riding cloud nine. Not so much for the deer, right? Not so great for him. That's what Peter's saying that their end is going to be like. The same type, same kind of animal, just pursuing an instinct, seeking their destruction. In their foolish pride, they too will walk to their death. That's what's happening here. And the reality is we have the same threat of danger for us as well. Like our pride is leading down that same path of destruction. Our pride is just the same, leading to destruction. So we have to ask ourselves then, if that's what actually pride leads to, like how do we sin in our pride? And the first way I think we sin in our pride is with pride in our hearts. And this is a sin motive. Like we sin because we trust the desires of our hearts are better than what God says is good for us. Like here's the problem with this though. Jeremiah 17 9 says that the heart is more deceptive than anything else. Like pride in our hearts, it's a sin of wrong trust. Um, the, the sin of pride, it manifests itself by us trusting ourselves as the true source of authoritative goodness. Like, I know what is good. Like, I know what's best. I know it more than God knows it, right? And I want goodness more for me than even God would want it. In fact, isn't this the very first sin that I know better than God knows on, on what's good in life? Like, what I want, what I believe, what I say, it outweighs in goodness or authority what God says. And so I will hold on and trust myself, and I'll seek good for myself and aim to protect myself and bring pleasure to myself. Like, I'll just trust the voice of my own heart. And the problem is, we reap what we sow. Like Proverbs 18, 12 says, Before destruction, a man's heart is haughty. And Proverbs 16, 18 tells us that pride, it goes before destruction. Proverbs 16, 5, that same chapter says, Everyone who is arrogant in the heart is an abomination to the Lord. Be assured, he will not go unpunished. The second way we sin in pride, though, is in our thoughts. Like, we, like, think about this, we who are finite, who can't even remember yesterday, nor can we understand the fullness of the day, nor have any idea of what tomorrow holds, yet we trust ourselves with the very course of our life. The way that this pride manifests itself in our thoughts is that we think we know what's best. Like, we choose to map out and plan our steps. We, we chart the direction where our life should go. In doing so, we fully ignore the, the God-given direction on how we should live. Proverbs 16.9 says that we can make our own plans, but the Lord determines our steps. We sin in our pride and by isolating the course of our life to the determination of our own planning. Like, when we ignore what God has said and rather choose to believe what we want, to be true. And then the third way we sin in pride is we sin in pride in our actions. Like the way this sh shows itself um, in our pride is by believing what we do is right, or at least that we can um, can be made right. And so we do this in one of two ways. The, the first way we often do this, we actually reveals itself in its inverse. We we just simply don't think our actions are wrong. Uh, we live ignoring or denying that what we do is sin. Or we convince ourselves that if, if God, do, like God doesn't see, nor does he care, um, or he simply won't do anything about it, right? Like, we sin and act as if our actions are hidden to God. But the other way we have pride in our actions is by thinking we can control God or trick God with what we deem to be right actions. And there's this tremendous irony that's happening here. Because on one hand, we attribute to God him not upholding goodness um, in response to our wrong actions. But then we become very strong believers in God's approval and ability to see our good actions, what we deem to be good things we do. Like, we trust somehow that our evil works are too small to even be seen by God, that he isn't perceptive enough to notice, or we trust that they don't even matter to him, or that he simply just doesn't care. But ironically, at the same time, we assume that he'll notice all of our good works, right? That somehow they're enough to outweigh the bad that he doesn't notice or even count. And that while he doesn't care about, or why he didn't care about our righteousness or, ju or justice against our evil, he loves the actions we deem to be right and good. And this, 
belief. It prevails our society, our culture, our city, like even our churches, right? Like, why do people think they're going to heaven? Because I'm a good person, right? Or, or um, how many times do people think they're saved, like have a get-out-of-hell-free card, and therefore can do whatever they want in their mind? Like, that's pride. That is all pride. And God says he opposes the proud. And this pride will lead to destruction. And make no mistake this morning, this pride, it marks your life, too. Like, as I was thinking about pride, I thought back to when I was, like, in 8th or ninth grade, in the story with my own dad. My dad was a youth pastor. He was, like, brand new as a youth pastor, and he had planned out this big scavenger hunt to, like, raise money for the local food bank. And I think the winner got, like, a cash prize or a gift card to a local pizza place. Um, something that, as an 8th or ninth grader, caused me to want to win. Um, and, and I did, But I didn't care about the rules of the game at all. Um, and so... Um, yeah, so as he planned this game, like I think it was something like whoever brought the most food back in 30 minutes won. I don't remember all the details, but here's why I share. Um, because he established this game for us. The only thing I really remember about it were the rules. And the reason I remember them is because I broke both of them. Like The rule one was that it was supposed to be you weren't allowed to drive. And that was actually meant to like help me as an eighth grader not be at a disadvantage. Um, the second one, though, is you, um, you couldn't buy food. Or you couldn't have any food that was bought. Um, because it would be really weird just to go like from porch to porch trying to barter with neighbors for their groceries. And so that was, again, a protection thing. Um, but basically what you need to know is like all I wanted was to win. Like I wanted to win this thing, and um, I knew my dad had just bought a couple turkeys. And so they're sitting in our deep freeze. So my buddy's dad is with me, called him, and he came and picked us up, breaking rule one, right? Um, drove home, put them in some freezer bags, like gigantic bags. Um, but on our way back, I was quick to, to recognize that he might notice that these were the exact ones he bought, because he just bought them. And also, he probably was going to catch on that we caught a ride, because our house was way too far to have walked to and back in 30 minutes. But we are way too far in on cheating at this point, and we didn't have much time. So we just doubled down. And the way we did this was we went and I bought a couple of cheesecakes for my buddy's restaurant, um, parents' restaurant, um, to try to like bribe my dad in case he caught us. So like breaking rule two now. Long story short, we were not very smart. We hopped out at the very front of the church. As he's standing there, as all the other teams are getting back, it's obvious that we're cheating at this point. And I just remember like how embarrassed he really was that the one person not doing what they were supposed to do and basically wrecking all these plans that he had made for, like, to try to do a good thing but also for our, enjoy and our enjoyment like was his own son. Like I just remember like really hurting him in that moment. But, but the reason I share that story is because that moment, it came out of sheer pride right like first was pride of my heart my motives it was all about me getting what i wanted in the end the second was pride of my thoughts like i schemed this whole plan just to go against what was asked of me and then finally pride of my actions like not only was i okay with doing the wrong thing that maybe he just wouldn't know but then i thought i could bribe my dad to overlook it like i could introduce something else that would make right the wrong and i know like even as you listen to this like this story, it seems really trivial and elementary and not at all that serious. And, and maybe it's not. But, but I share this because if I were to sin in something so small, so temporary, so, so trivial, right? Like what happens when the stakes are raised? Like when the decisions actually have more impact? When there seems to be a lot more attached to winning or losing or having or not having? Here's what I want you to know. Like in that moment, I don't become more moral on my own. Or, or better yet, I don't become less prideful. Like, my trajectory from that moment to now, on my own accord, like, I don't outgrow my pride. That hasn't happened. But rather, my pride has just continued to grow, and so does the damage that would follow both me and be given to others. So as we sit in this, just to come back to the false teachers in the text, like, we need to see the deep destruction that can come with pride. But also then we're going to see this pride actually just continues to build. Because not only is it a promise to destroy them, but it builds into the next two sins that we're going to see. From this pride, two more sins come out of it. Lust and grief. And so we're going to look first in verses 13 and 14 at their sin of lust. Peter says, They consider it a pleasure to carouse in the broad daylight. They are spots and blemishes, delighting in their deceptions while they feast with you. 
They have eyes full of adultery that never stop looking for sin. These false teachers, here's what's happening here. They're actually sinning in a way that not even like Roman or Gentile pagans did. It, it says they consider it pleasure to, to carouse in broad daylight, meaning that they were so shameless and so sinful that they partook in sin in the daytime that even the most degenerate person would normally seek to hide at night. That's what's being said here. And then, this sin was both paining and hurting the church. It says they were a stain and a blemish to the church. It's because they were coming to these church gatherings in full knowledge of their sin, and was heart set on sinning there. Like, it says they're coming to eat a meal, right? And what you need to know is this meal is either attached to the Lord's Supper, or even might have been the Lord's Supper itself, right? Like the meal where Jesus says, this is my body, broken for you. Eat this in your members of me. And it's the meal for the people who Jesus called his body that he bought and brought together through the bleeding of his own. And you see what these people are coming to do? They're coming to, to do this body during this meal, seeking to sin. I mean, it says they have eyes full of adultery as they come. This means that when they see a woman, here's what's being said, when they see a woman, the only thing they see is an object to satisfy their lustful thoughts and desires. Like, women to them were quite literally, quite literally temporary means of satisfaction to be taken for their own gain. And they're coming to these gatherings just for that purpose. Like, the level of objectifying and dehumanizing and using and abusing this type of constant action represents I think would be the level of sin for them to call themselves a Christ follower, and yet this is their desire and their aim as they come to church, right? The thing is, this is just as prevalent in our own society. And we could show this in so many ways. But just consider just even one with me, like sin of pornography, like an industry built and sustained on the unfilled, lustful eye, and the trapped use and abuse of image bearers of God. Like a website that holds the images and acts meant to be covered and saved to be privately given to only one person now can be accessed by the whole world? And not only that, but this industry is built off of storing and showcasing acts of rape, sexual assault, unknown tapings, like underage children, right? Like what type of person speaks this? Well, a person whose lust can't be quenched, right? And that's who these false teachers were. But it's also who millions of men and women are today as well. This is who large percentages of those in our churches are today as well. Caught, consumed, captive to sin. As we think about this, we realize it's really hard to claim Jesus as Lord when sin like this reigns. And the most obvious reason why is because this sin looks nothing like Jesus, what Jesus calls us to. But there's another reason why. And it's that Jesus says we can actually only have one master. And if I'm continuing in my sin, I have to ask myself, to whom am I really bound? Like, am I tied in with Jesus? Am I actually grafted in to him? Or am I a captive to sin, enslaved in my lust? Like, think with me. Jesus, he's a good Lord, loving and kind. Like, he gave up his life to save you so that you could, like, be promoted to be equal to reign with him from his throne for eternity. Like, that is what being captive to this Lord looks like as you follow him. But lust and sin, they only prove to be a cruel master. Like, well, Jesus, he gave up his life to give you yours? Like, lust, it holds you captive as it seeks to kill you. So one of the questions for us for today is, like, who are you bound to? Like, Jesus or your sin? Like, think with me about it. Like, sexual sin. It's described as an act of individual freedom. But in reality, it's one of complete bondage. Like, these teachers, they boast in their free desire to sin, right? Boundless lust. But actually, they're in complete bondage to it. And as we think about this, like, today... Nowadays, there has not been an age where it's been easier for someone to be trapped and enslaved to limitless lust. Or, or put another way, it's never been harder for people to avoid this trap. Like, our phones alone, and what we have access to, like what temptation calls us to do, like whether it be secret Google searches, 
lying spouses covering adulterous conversations, sexual messages or Snapchats, like no commitment instant hookups with one right swipe, social pressure to show more, reveal more, experience more, and really the list could go on and on and on. Like these false teachers, they aren't the only people consumed, controlled, at the risk of remaining captive to us, right? And as we think about this, I realize, like, the sin of lust, it brings great shame as we really unpack how it enslaves us. But then, like, what we realize is the sin Jesus talked most about was that of greed, right? Like, he talked way more about greed and money. But yet the sin most celebrated by our culture today, I think, is actually our love of money. Because while these levels of lust are dirty and disturbing and embarrassing to us, like, the pursuit of money, it's celebrated. And those who are actually trapped in it they're often regarded as being the most brilliant and to be envied. So this leads to the third example that Peter gives about false teachers and their sin that we need to learn from. It's their instinctive greed. Pick up again here at the end of verse 14. It says, They seduce unstable people and have hearts trained in greed, children under a curse. They have gone astray by abandoning the straight path and have followed the path of Balaam, the son of Bozer, who loved the wages of wickedness but received a rebuke for his lawlessness. A speechless donkey spoke of him with a human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. What, what Peter's saying is, is that their hearts, he says, they have been trained in grief. Like, they're literally like athletes pursuing a prize. Like, who are working out to, like in devoted time and giving resources and time to develop muscles of grief. And these false teachers, they practice swindling and exploitation um, to the point that like sin is now second nature to them. It's like breathing to them now. Greed is and, and taking from people. And in this, we see Peter even goes on to illustrate this immoral greed of the false teachers by comparing them to this prophet named Balaam in the Old Testament, the book of Numbers. What, what you need to know about Balaam, he was a prophet who became um, a prophet for hire to curse God's people. Um, and put most simply, like um, leader of Moab um, called upon Balaam and asked him to come and curse Israel. And so eventually ba- um, Balaam made his way to Moab and as he was going, this was clearly against God's will. He says he's incensed by it in the book of Numbers we see. Balaam's walking in this way and his donkey stops three times. And as he stops three times it's revealed um, because eventually God opens the mouth of the donkey, which is crazy and he begins to speak. So I will walk because there's an angel guarding the way with a sword seeking to kill you. And so um, Balaam eventually still goes on um, gives in is his love of money. It marks his life. But this is who he is. He's remembered as being really a complete sellout in the end. Like, he was meant to be a prophet of God, but instead he valued the prophet of the dollar more, right? That's what we see here. And this is who these false teachers are being compared to. But as we read this, we just need to quickly, again, remember that this isn't just a warning against false teachers, but to all of us. Because how often do we make family and career choices based solely on the financial benefit to us? Like, isn't our main filter in making decisions often money? Like, money talks. Money drives. Money decides. We've been covet- become covetous and envious of resources that we can't keep. And we would never be satisfied even if we could obtain them. And yet, in seeking them, we've sold out our lives, too. Because what we have to remember is greed, like all sin. It comes with the price of our lives. Like, the irony of greed is it's not just the love of money, too. It's the love of actually more money, right? Greed constantly wants what it does not have. It's never satisfied. Greed is a aimless pursuit. Because once you get what you long for, you want the next thing that you think is behind it. Yet, nonetheless, in this pursuit, the exchange cost of this pursuit is your own life. Again, just like Balaam, it, it cost him his life. Like his job is calling, right? His reputation, his dignity, by the way we remember him. But even more, it cost him his life because he was consumed by greed and no longer the good that God wanted for him. And then it cost him his life because we actually see to the Midianite um, nation, he actually died by the sword because of his sin. But then we have to see our sin. It even goes beyond this. Like, I can't speak for Balaam's eternal state because I just don't no, but what I can say is, if we seek greed, like any sin, it means you actually have to sell your soul. 
like every time we sin. Outside of the grace Jesus gives us, at least on the cross, we are simply just doubling down the debt we owe to sin. Like, that's the cost of sin. Your own life. So I want to ask you, like, what sin is worth the price of your life, right? Like, do you appropriately understand the cost of sin? And that is this. It's your life. Like, your sin. It's either another wage right now, like you who are listening, wherever you're at, on whether you're in Christ or not in Christ, it's either another wage being added to your account of deserved eternal death, or you're in Christ, like you're a Christian, and good, great. But if your response is simply that I'm safe, it doesn't matter, like you don't get it. You don't get it because any person in Christ realizes that sin is actually what held Jesus to the cross. And it may not be your death anymore, but even worse, it was Jesus who had to die so that you could live. Like, therefore, if that's the case, you can no longer nonchalantly live and grieve. But really, you can't nonchalantly live in lust or pride as well. And then what we see then is the only then re- appropriate response to all of these things that we just unpacked is the same that should be to any false teaching, which is to flee, to run. Like, we should run from sin, that you and I, we not may not be at their level of sin yet, but we are tempted by the same sins nonetheless. And we must run from them. But as we run, we also must remember that we don't run aimlessly. Like, the gospel, it calls us to run to Jesus. Like, the beauty of the gospel, this is what's so beautiful about it. It isn't do better, and then you can become. But rather, it's I've done for you now you can simply be. That's the gospel. So our response to sin, it isn't be better. It's see Jesus is better. That's the gospel. And then run to him. Run to him. Because you on your own, you'll never defeat your pride. Because really just trying is actually just more pride. But he who is God, right, did not count equality with God something to be grasped, but rather instead made himself human, wrapped himself in flesh, and came and lived and died in your place. And he humbled himself and therefore beat the death that was the price our pride needed to have paid. You also, you won't defeat your lust. Like, sin is never defeated by just committing to stop it, right? Like, you have to see Jesus is better and more beautiful than your sin that's seeking to hold you captive. And just right now, like, if you're trapped in sin, I just want to remind you, you can't do this alone. Like, pornography in particular, we've already talked about. Like, that's an addiction issue. And we don't have the time to unpack all the ways that it acts like a drug and has chemically rewired your brain. But what I can say is, Jesus saves you before you could ever fix yourself. Like, you being saved is not contingent again on you becoming perfect for Him, but it's contingent on that He is perfect and He's calling you as your Master. But nonetheless, for Him to be your Lord, you do have to confess it. Like, you confess who he is as Lord, but you also confess that the sin that held you captive no longer does. Right? Like, a way to kill sin in your life today is to call it out for what it is. That old master, that dead master that used to hold you, and to speak like, speak of it in this way. Like, the killed former captor that Jesus crushed on the cross. So walk freely by confessing your sins and bring it to the light. Like, live as someone set free. Run to Jesus. Lastly, you won't ever pay the debt of your sin. But you can see Jesus is better than your sin by trusting what he has paid is more than you could ever owe. Like, his goodness, it outweighs your evil. Like, his payment is greater than your debt. That's the gospel. So as, I, as we think about that, we have to ask, like, what payment marks the reality of your soul right now? Like the one you paid towards sin? Or is it the one of a Savior who laid down his life for you? The reason we can say this is because what sin could ever outweigh Jesus' purchase of your soul? Like none, right? None. So run to him. As we read Second Peter 2, we, we constantly remember that we should run from false teachers. But even this morning now we see we should also run from the sin that held them, because they can also bind and hold us. But as we run, may it be 
to Jesus. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you again for promises that you didn't give us a handbook and all the things that we have to get right. And as it's a mirror and it reflects, God, my own sin, God, the answer isn't find a way to become what I can never be, but rather see the one who became what I don't deserve and yet did it in love and grace for me and did it perfectly and did it in my place. May, may we see Jesus this morning. God, would you give us eyes to see clearly your love for us, what you've done for us, what it could mean for our lives, that you've actually changed lives, you've changed hearts, you've changed the course of our direction. You have more for us than we could ever imagine or want. May we see you, may we trust you, and may we trust you. We pray this morning. of heaven Who else could make every king bow down Who else can whisper in darkness trembles Only a holy God What of the beauty demands such praises What of the splendor
Thank you guys so much for joining us online today for our service. My name is Aaron Rogers. I'm one of the pastors here, and we have a few things that we want to announce before we end our service today. The first thing is that we want to just connect with you. If you are new to our church during this online season, we want to know your name and how we can pray for you and get to know you. On our website, you'll see an online connect card that you can click on, fill out, let us know how we can answer any questions, pray for you anything to help you during this season. Also, this past Thursday, we dropped our first episode of our How to Read the Bible equipping series. This is a three-week, three-part series on our desire to help connect you to God's word better every single day of your life. And so each week, we're going to be developing an equipping series simply to help you learn and know how to read God's word better. So be looking for that each Thursday. There's two more coming up. Really excited about that content as it comes into your life. Lastly, guys, I am thrilled to talk about this final announcement. We've been counting down the weeks until we could say this out loud. And I can say it, (laughs) finally, this next Sunday, this coming Sunday, August 2nd, we will be regathering in person. Now, there's a few details inside of that. The most important is that we're not going to be to regather in person inside a building. We are still in phase three as a state as Kansas, which limits gatherings inside to 45 or less. So what we're going to do is we're going to gather outside and a local uh, Christian school, Veritas, has given us thumbs up to meet on one of their green spaces at their school. You can see the website on the graphic on the screen. This coming Sunday, we're going to gather. We're going to ask you to wear masks. We're going to social distance, but we are going to get together as a church body for the first time in so long and cry out to King Jesus together, read his word together. We're so, so excited. So please mark your calendars for next weekend, August 2nd. We're going to be moving our service time to 9.30 a.m. So we can kind of beat the the midday heat and uh, all of our families with kids can come out. Uh, Hopefully that's good with everybody's nap schedules and everything. Bring your own cup of coffee. Guys, August 2nd, get ready. I'm excited to see you. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Bye.